All right, so it's Richard here with James Keeley. This is sort of part two. Um, we were having a chat before about a range of things about teaching and maths. And um, I'd forgotten, forgotten to, we'd forgotten to talk about the one thing that was uh, a real hot topic. Uh, it's certainly a hot topic of mine, and that is explicit teaching. But I'm not going to let James run with the ball first because I think we both agreed that we were both confused as to what the heck this thing called explicit teaching really is. So uh, over to you. Yeah, because I read that article where one of the things you said about people think that explicit teaching is very much identically equal to teacher-directed learning or the approach maybe. I'm not sure what the definition is because I was sort of looking at it coming from my view, which is explicit functions versus implicit functions, where you're looking at explicit differentiation, implicit differentiation, yeah. and thinking, well, the information's either laid out very clearly or you sort of have to work to get it. And they say, well, implicit would be working to get it, whereas explicit would be clearly stated. And I was thought it was sort of related to that explicit quality criteria that's written in that quality teaching framework. Right. That people sort of look at, look at it that way, and that they kind of view it as your traditional. There's some modelling, there's some guided practice, there's some independent practice, and there's there's feedback delivered at, at at each of those stages. And that if it's not sort of done in that that model, that they might say that there's no explicit. It's not explicit teaching, but I wasn't sure exactly. I think there's a, a everybody kind of brings their own definition to that play. I don't know. What do you think? Well, like I I sat through a whole session at Mansfield Conference last year on explicit teaching, mainly because I wanted to I wanted to find out whether what I thought explicit teaching was was wrong. Because and I actually yeah. I, I'm not going to say the presenter was, but I knew I knew the presenter and we'd been having chats, and I thought well I'd be interested to see. But I was none the wiser coming out of there. Like it, it made me no more confident that what I thought teaching, explicit teaching was, was correct or incorrect. So what, what I think it is, and, and look, anytime you mention student-centered learning or conceptually based learning, teachers will interpret, misinterpret what you're saying in 10 different ways. And what they go, oh, right, so you think explicit teaching is not important, or you think that there's no place for the, the teacher lecture, or... Yeah. Or so yeah. what? You've got to use hands-on equipment all the time. Or there's all these. Or, or so you're saying that, you're saying that procedures aren't important, so you don't teach procedures. <laughs> and I'm going. Well, I haven't said that. So now we're in. I don't know if you've read any of my articles, but I explain all these things and try to handle these misconceptions. And yep. and I've yep. come down to saying, look, I think teaching, particularly mathematics teaching, is about teaching for understanding first, having the kids understand what the hell they're doing, and then come the procedures. And because, well, here's a question that's pretty scary to ask oneself as a math teacher. How many, how many kids are sitting in my classroom not understanding what's going on for a fair chunk of every lesson? And if, and if uh, that's because, uh, like, in 12 years of schooling, there was three lessons in year 11 where I didn't understand what's going on and I hated maths. Three lessons out of 12 years. Well, how do yeah. these kids cope who sit in mass and they don't they don't hardly mm. understand place value and we're trying to get them to do fractions and stuff and it's mm. just yep. it's got to be yep. the yep. worst mm. form it of is. educational torture that we can put these kids through to do maths. There's no wonder kids hate maths. Like if they, if we can't get them to understand, what's the point? Anyway, that's a different rant. But I, so what my point is when we're teaching, I, I'm saying we, you know, the, the understanding needs to come first therefore it kind of needs to be a more uh, student-centered and conceptually based approach kids need to take ownership but the procedures are still really important but let's not just have them let's not have our default mode as just here's procedure one copy it down do five questions here's procedure two here's the next procedure here's hmm. an example five questions you know let that yeah. not be the default there's still a place for that uh, although hmm. some people argue there isn't but anyway i'd say there is hmm. but there's certainly a place for for a hundred percent lecture focused teacher directed instruction right but let's not make them 15 minutes long let's make them three or five minutes yeah. long yeah. and yeah. and yeah. have them being active as much as possible so but when we're doing that i think we, it needs to be really explicit which means and that this is where i think the explicit teaching comes in you know really think and learn how to make the information very clear um concise good questioning uh feedback techniques all that sort of stuff now as for the the student-centered aspect. I don't know. I don't think the student-centered discussion happens within the explicit teaching discussion. 
But I, I think some people would say that you can still have kids doing sort of student-centred type activities, but the teacher's got to be really in control. And and I agree with that. Like, in it, I advocate highly structured student-centred approaches. Mm. So yeah, yeah. So you know, you actually know more about what's going on than you do in a teacher-centred mm. yep. thing, because you're not just lecturing. You're actually seeing the kids working, and you're and you're moving around, and you're you're finding out information. You're seeing kids doing things that you didn't know they were capable of because they're yep. controlling their learning. So what do I think? I, I don't know, I suspect that explicit teaching is mostly talking about being really good at being a teacher-directed teacher and really good at your information and your eyes are alive and you're passionate and you're doing feedback exercises and you're finding out what they're doing and and you know, you're know yeah. 100% in control of what's going on and maybe you do some pretty cool kind of other activities which give the kids some sort of agency as well but that's what i think it is yeah but, but i don't my... i don't think the student-centered aspect which is really important for student agency i don't think that topic would come up in if i was running if i was the explicit teaching expert i don't think the mm. word student-centered would even be mentioned once unless it was in yeah. a negative way that mm. well we don't we don't you know we don't deal with student-centered that's that's silly you know yeah. That's what I think, yeah. but I have no yeah. idea if <laughs> if I'm correct or not, because I, I've looked at definitions. Sorry, last thing I've looked at definitions yeah. on on Google, and I read bits and yeah. pieces. I'm yeah. still none the wiser. Yeah. I have no idea. Anyway, yeah. what about yeah. you? Yeah. No, my my thinking. What I what I felt like to start with, I, I thought that people sort of assume, and this is what I think is true. At some point, new information has to be delivered to the student to work with. Has to get new information because I, I, I would say I'd define it rather than what it is, what it's not. Yeah. I think what it isn't is when you get these sort of activities where it's completely open-ended and the group just discusses things. They already know everything they're discussing. No new information is put there and they're directed to do I know there was an example where we had a challenge-based learning day and we were there and every time the bloke just did a bunch of PowerPoints on things that didn't make much sense, then we were told to just discuss some topic or come up with activities amongst ourselves. No new information input in order, not like here is a topic, here is this information, like let's say you have a, a here's a circle, a square or something here, now you have to make a set of shapes. There's no new information to work yeah. with. It's just you you bring everything you have there and you're just reprocessing that information you already possess. Nothing new is being brought in. But when new information is brought in, I think there needs to be some degree of direction to it that gives you, yeah. like ideally some sort of self-direction, but something that gives you some sort of measure of performance that you'll be able to say, have we made any sort of progress here? And yeah. some feedback is given, which I think that skateboarding example was good, but you could use anything like a basketball free throw where you say, you know, if you've gone, if it's gone in the hoop and you've, you've, yeah. you've done well, yeah. if it misses, you've not, but there's something to do with the new information has to come in there and that there has to be some way of working with that will, will give you some sort of objective measure to it. And uh, if I look at just the definition, it says stated clearly and in detail, leaving no room for confusion and doubt which is where if we look at this and go, I think this is part of the problem is in the research definition that someone goes, how would you know a kid was explicitly taught? Well, you ask these students, they say, I know what this is. I'm very confident. I, I, I can explain this, this clearly. They're confident in about it. So if, they, if, they did, if a student does that, you would say, well, it's kind of like when they say in Hattie's research, collective teacher efficacy, which is saying, oh, if you've got an apartment of great math teachers, oh, those students have excellent outcomes. It's like, no doubt, they all have been. It's like saying, okay, just well, that's what I need to do. I just need to be a good teacher. If I'm a good teacher and surrounded by other good teachers, then I'll have an excellent, I'll have excellent results. And you say, this is after the fact. This is the result of good things. It's mm. not the cause of it, but they're putting the card before the horse because they don't understand the correlation aspect of, of the research. So it's like saying, I want my kid to be taller. I'll get him to play basketball. You say, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I think, again, it's probably the experts would probably not, They'd probably say what you're doing in your classroom and what I'm trying to advocate is that falls under the, maybe it falls under the umbrella of explicit teaching, but maybe it's more the interpretation. The interpretation, yeah. I reckon most people coming out of explicit teaching, I just think it, maybe they're just thinking it's teacher-directed because they don't think that student-centred is, is an option because it involves too much equipment, it, it wastes time, what's the other one? And mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's no structure. Right, <laughs> misconceptions. Right, so we're not even going to think about students. Yeah. In I think that maybe maybe that's the issue, is that people think it's. Got oh, to, that's that's what I think too. Yeah, it's it's got to be teacher directed or student centred. Student centred doesn't work. 
it's too, I mean, you save time if you once you get this, once you get your system right. It takes too much time. It's you know, it's 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 all too much hands-on equipment, and that doesn't work in high school. And uh, you know, it's unstructured, and the kids just you know don't learn anything. You know, so we we won't even think about that. So I'm in an explicit teaching uh, workshop. It's obviously teacher centered. I, I think yeah. maybe that's what's yeah. going on. See, because I because yeah. if we go back, yeah. no, go on. Oh, if we go to this definition here, it just says something that's stated clearly and in detail, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. So, in other words, students come out of your lesson not confused, with not doubt. They well, say, "I understand what it is. I'm not confused." Then anything that accomplishes that, I thought would be explicit. Right. So here, so we agree that we think, <laughs> we think <laughs> that yeah. teachers are misinterpreting it as it must be teacher-centered, right? So the way I used to teach yeah. coordinate geometry, which I think is the way most coordinate geometry, year nine coordinate geometry is taught, was fully teacher-centered. By the textbook, I don't know, if there's three, the, main, the three main, you know, I think you start with the distance formula and then you do the midpoint formula and then you do the gradient formula and then you're starting to get kids to play with the graphs and, and work out the ordered pair tables. And every time without fail, and I love this topic, one of my favourite topics, every time without fail, the kids were completely through the floorboards, hated what, had no idea what was going on, right? Yep. And then, and I, this, and then I, I, I thought, when I, was in my, when I was really thinking about these conceptual ways and student-centred, I, I developed this unit of work and that eventually became a course. So that the, the principles that you've just done, that they're actually infused in this shorter course called, um, well, it's a long title. It's got something to do with uh, formative assessment, but it's really conceptual um, coordinate geometry, right? And so I, I tested the water on a face-to-face -face setting and then I put it out as a course and very few people have done it because like, who wants to do a course on coordinate geometry? Well, that's missing the point, <laughs> right? If you want to see all these ideas infused in one topic, and then that you can use, then you can use those principles and other topics. Here's an example. But my my point here is this is not just an advertisement, of course. My point here is that within the f uh, second lesson, in the second lesson, I've got kids um, with coming out, and I, I I can write an equation, a simple like a, a y equals two x plus three, y equals two thirds x minus six, something like that. Simple equation on the board. And they can lay a, 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 a straight line on a grid and just go, bang, there it is, right? Change the equation, bang, there it is. And vice versa, here's an equation, here's a, line, here's a straight line that obviously passes through the, the corners of the, of the grid. So it's, you know, it's one that you can read the gradient off. And what's the equation? And they can write it down. This is the second lesson of the unit, right? Because I realized that the y equals mx plus b or c, whatever you say, is the most intuitive formula. So we, we leave the general form to way later in the unit. And ordered tables of ordered pairs, tables of values, confuses the heck out of kids. So we don't even bother with those. But, but I have all these activities where the kids are working with these formulas, like finding distance between two points, but they're not using a formula. They actually got these grids and they'll, they'll Kind of working out with Pythagoras and and with the mid with the midpoint, it's intuitively obvious they can work out where the midpoint is going to be and and then with the with the gradient form, same thing. And then when we throw the formula, I should get them to come up with the formulas themselves. But when when you throw them the formula, they go, "This is what we've been doing for the last lesson." I go, "Yeah, all right, no worries." Yeah, and yeah. and so you save time. These, and I'm obviously advanced kids are going to survive regardless of whether you teach them or not. They'll just look at the text and work it out. Um, but they they are engaged, and again, it's student more student centered. Kids can progress at their own pace, but it's those kids in the middle that could go into your advanced classes and do serious maths in year eleven, or they crash and burn and end up in standard. Right? Those kids, yeah. almost all the time, crash and burn in the in the um, you know with those sorts of kind of harder topics at year nine, you know, trigonometry, coordinate geometry, that's, oh, this is getting a bit abstract. That's where they crash and burn in a teacher-directed, yeah, yeah, yeah. traditional, yeah. formula-based approach. And have those kids thrive and go, oh, I thought I would have struggled with this, but this was, this was great, you know. And so that's the power, I think. Now, so why am I, why am I giving that big rant? Because we're talking about explicit teaching. 
So from your definition, that is explicit teaching. No, I'd say so, yeah, yeah. But it's if not, event, oh. but I don't think it would be perceived because if I was giving this explanation outside of the explicit teaching context and then said to someone, so would you call that explicit? No, 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 because no, it's explicit teaching is teacher directed. So I'm, um, just, I'm just interested. You got me. You got me thinking there. I want to look something up here because ultimately, when they say about this sort of stuff, they take the Hattie research and they look at the, the effect size of these things. Now, if we talked about feedback, well, can, well can, feedback can, often can, often means you. I would say feedback's a type of explicit teaching, isn't it? Can I just say, if we're going to follow Hattie, then we don't <laughs> touch student-centered learning at all. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> no, and, no, and 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 yeah, nor yeah, yeah. nor would we touch. Um, you know, a conceptual approach. Yeah. But yeah. but but here's the crazy thing, right? So student-centered working apparently doesn't work, right? So I'm going to run a little yeah. half-day workshop with 100 teachers, mm. teach them how to do a student-centered approach, right? And then let them go yeah. out in the workforce and then, then yeah, see the yeah, results. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> You're going to get 100 <laughs> different approaches and yep, most of them yep, aren't yep. going to work. But if I teach no. <laughs> a teacher-directed approach to 100 people, you might get two different yeah. things come out of that. And according yeah. to the narrow parameters I'm setting, they work. Oh, therefore, therefore, student center doesn't work. What a crock. Like you just yeah. can't yeah. make. Yeah. I've even got, I've even got on, on a YouTube video, um, a guy called Dylan William, who's explains why yeah, I've heard we him too. can't uh, be he using very good, very big good data yeah. <laughs> in education. Yeah. And he's one of yeah. his mates. You know, it drives yeah. me nuts. <laughs> but I know how his stuff on feedback is really good. But you know these yeah. these gurus, they come out with all their blah blah, and, and um, it's da it can get dangerous. Like, um, well, I'm I'm potentially dangerous because I'm nowhere in that course did I say, well, this is this is you know Edward yeah. Edward Flynn's research and it's all scientifically backed. I'm just taking <laughs> an approach that is. Um, I mean, it's it's not that that I, there's any ideas in, in those courses that aren't that don't have some sort of research backing. But I don't come from the research backing. I just come from common sense, feet on the ground, um, this is what works. Yeah. Well, this is my, my little thought there because my understanding of it is that these effect sizes are often derived from the kind of observational research that has a problem of it being based off of correlations. Yeah. Now, it's completely, it obviously happens in a certain situation where you have two variables and they're correlated. Well, X could be causing Y. Y could be causing X, or perhaps there's a variable Z that is causing both of Y and Z. Yeah. And that sometimes when you do these sort of analyses, when you're talking about multivariate analysis, we need to look at it from all of the different possibilities to try and see what these correlations look like. Yeah. If we only look at it from one angle, we'll, we'll derive a set of correlatory things here. Now, I would say if you're giving direct feedback to a student, that is a type of explicit teaching. Yep. Is it not? Yeah. So if I look at this on this, feedback has this, effect size 0.7 explicit teaching has a, feed, a, a size 0.57 so perhaps all of these explicit teaching strategies is derived from that benefit from the feedback that is given to the students and that it's watered down by the fact that we have this standing up the front of the class and telling it which is perhaps not so effective and at that time by having a student-centered model you enable more feedback to be delivered directly yeah. to the student in a timely and appropriate fashion and so in that way perhaps this this focus on explicit teaching is a, a misallocation of resources and that the less we can do it the better if we can redirect explicit teaching to feedback but it's not always possible to do that sometimes you might need to introduce all the information to the students at once but sometimes it's better to do it in a series of mini lessons and if that's focused around feedback yeah. then that would be even using the the research given by uh, mr hattie for the need for explicit teaching strategies that if we're doing more time for feedback and allowing more feedback to individual students, then that would be surely better yeah, than explicit yeah. teaching. Look, I, I, I think, I suspect that the, it, the main issue with explicit teaching is 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 a misinterpretation of, that it's that it means yeah, teacher think, direction. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the proponents of explicit teaching's fault. I think it's because we mm. have this mindset that student centered doesn't work. There's a big confusion. Yeah. That's what I, yeah. you know, if, if I can die having made some impact. Um, that a number of teachers have realised that there is a way that you can empower kids through a more student-centred approach that actually works in the classroom, that doesn't ignore procedures, that that is fun to teach, that kids do crack onto, that does allow for metacognition, then that's a good thing. 
And um, but I think the explicit, explicit teachers would would agree that that's a good thing. Um, I mean, the explicit experts, but it, you know, it's, it gets down to jargon. And I just think I think what's really important is that we create a system where kids can get agency over their learning, take responsibility, and it takes time. But they won't do that if I'm just talking at them all lesson. Yeah. Or or, or yeah. if that is my pretty much only default method of giving instructions by talking at them that doesn't allow any room for and it doesn't allow as much room for aha moments either so anyway i think we agree on that but um uh, that explicit teaching is i'm still in the dark uh less in the dark though this has been a good chat because i think it i think it comes down to misinterpretation more than anything um, yeah yeah i think so i think you're right i think it's a much it's a much bigger field and yeah. people think that it's if you drew a venn diagram that your teacher directed an explicit uh uh identical yeah. set but in reality, there's there's a, a much bigger field of what would be classed as explicit teaching. Mind you, and, if you drew on the other side a student-centred circle, I agree mm. that a lot of the student-centred stuff would be outside of the yeah. that explicit circle. Yeah. I mean, you look at yeah. Montessori, That I wouldn't say that's explicit, but that doesn't make Montessori bad, mm. right? And you look at... Um, yeah. You look at problem-based solving you know like these there are a few schools around where the kids run the curriculum run their own program and the teachers are totally facilitators i'm all for that yeah. but that doesn't that's not explicit teaching um yeah but what are we what are we aiming for for, for um I, I was actually listening to the the ceo of one of those schools and I, and, and I, i'm thinking well how do they get past the kind of the standards thing and the exams and and what they do is that they don't try to get they don't, they don't try to accommodate with exams. They, they just go straight to the universities and say, hey, look, if we've got kids coming out of our, our system with these wonderful portfolios, you should have a look at them because they'll probably thrive at your university. So these kids don't even do the exams. I'm thinking, well, that's yeah. genius, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not what yeah. I'm yeah. promoting in, in my yeah. work because not, that's not my area of expertise. But, um, you know, so <laughs> what are we trying to achieve here? Well, I, I would like to achieve. Uh, well, actually, let me ask this question: In any of the imp implementations, forget about my, that course you're doing. Any time you've tried to implement change, like you change something up that's quite different, like new approach, new new activity that's quite different, has how often is that a hundred percent because you want to increase the kids' test scores because you're unhappy with how they're performing? Or how much of it is it because you know that this is a good direction to head in, this is going to get more cohesion, this is going to get more buy-in? Oh, def definitely, definitely part two, yeah, yeah, in, that, in general. Because, I mean, a lot, a lot of the students that we have at, at our school, they're not going to finish high school. That's just the reality of it. Uh, some, of, some of those students yeah. are going to have a they, – they're going to go out and do something else. And to try and get them a situation where they're not coming to school and just having failure after failure after failure yeah. to extend that would be would, I, that's that's a step. I'd I'd love to ask this to teachers on mass because I yeah there's so much focus on standards and raising your you know compliance raising your, your results and all this sort of stuff. And and I I a while ago I looked back at my career and I thought you know I never implemented anything except if, if a class bombs out in a test then I'll do something to rectify that that that's a different thing. But when I've and I've always been trying to, you know, improve, do try different things, you know, different strategy. I think this would be really good, but it was never to improve results. It was always to get that buy-in, to get that engagement, that authentic engagement, to, to get that vibe in the classroom that was where the learning was a, a, a co-creation. You know, that it was always about that, but maybe I'm weird. I don't know. Um, but I thought, because if someone said to me, right, you have to make this change, you have to change in this way because we need better results. I don't know that I, I don't even know if I would have, unless I could see the point. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. so I don't, but I'm, I started teaching a long, a long time ago. So, you know, I think we didn't have the same pressure on us back then. But anyway, questions worth thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. James, let's call it quits there. Um, stay on the line, but uh, thanks for chatting. Uh, this is part of the uh, Have a Chat series, and um, it was great. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I did, yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Time went quickly. Cheers. <laughs>